my Father's Day gift one year. My kids got this for me. It says, this is my dad mug because my kids are cooler than yours. <laughs> they got all of their smart aleckness from their mother because I still have all of mine. Take your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to finish up talking about the false prophets. This morning we're going to talk about their ultimate exposure, how they're going to be seen, how they're going to reveal themselves. And uh, this is important, and there's some important passage here that we need to take a little bit of time to look at uh, because there's some, there's some confused teaching here, and let's make sure we get this down as good as we can this morning. So 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20, we'll start reading there. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from his holy commandment delivered unto them but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again in the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Father, we ask again for your blessing on the message that you would do as you desired this morning, that you'd use me as your vessel. Father, I surrender to you. I pray that you'd use me as you choose. Father, I pray that we would uh, just take what you have for us today and use it to be aware and to see the things that are there those that are coming, and, and uh, Father, we just be prepared, knowing that you are the great and mighty God, and that we don't have to be afraid of these things that are coming, but that, Father, we have to be aware of these things, so we're not taken by surprise, taken um, by, by false teachings. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would do all things that you desire to do, that you would let us know that you are here with us in very real ways. And we walk out of this place, we can truly say, truly, we have been in the presence of a holy God. We love you, we thank you, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is how they're going to reveal themselves. They're going to go back to what they were originally. Now, this passage is used a lot of times to teach that you can lose your salvation. And I want to make sure that we understand while we're seeing how false teachers are revealed, how they are exposed, that we also understand this is not teaching about salvation or losing salvation. The Bible is very clear that once you have received Christ, it's a done deal. You cannot lose your salvation. You cannot walk away from your salvation. You cannot give it back. You cannot sin to the point that you're no longer saved. We looked at that a little bit when we looked at Peter talking about how, how Lot had vexed his soul. He had become living like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And how he said the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous out of the affliction and how to reserve the unjust for judgment. And so we see that there's a, a theme there. But I want you to look. So here's the key pieces that are used. They have escaped the pollutions of the world through knowledge of Christ. They turned back to their old ways. And it's better if they had not known the way of righteousness than to know and turn. So a couple of key pieces here, some that are just kind of simple and some that are absolutely scriptural. Keep in mind that nowhere in Scripture does Christ, God, the Holy Spirit ever refer to a child of God as a dog or a hog. Sheep and children is how he refers to those who have trusted him, trusted Christ as their Savior. I, I worked with a man who I love very dearly. He was a different belief structure than I was. And he asked me one day, he said, do you really believe that if you've been saved, that you're eternally secure? I said, absolutely, I do. And he said, I'd like to talk to you about that. I said, I would be happy to, I'd love to. I said, but I'm not interested in debating for, for denominations or, or just arguing for the sake of arguing. He said, no, I'm actually dealing with this. I know what I've been taught, and you seem to have a different view, and you seem to stand on some scripture for it. I'd like to know why you believe what you believe. I said, okay, let's pick a neutral place. And then for the next week, I want you to pray. We're both going to pray. I want you to take a notepad and write down every verse that you believe shows that you can lose your salvation. 
and I will do the same thing, then we'll come together in a neutral place where neither one of us have the authority over the other, and we'll sit down, and we'll just compare notes and then see. And when we came back together, he had five verses, and I had about five or six pages it, on a legal pad of reasons, verses, passages, and, and texts that I believe show that you cannot lose your salvation. And, and I would say to you, be careful when we, when we do these things, when we talk about these, or when you share with somebody. This is not about a battle. It's not about tearing somebody apart. It's not about trying to rip their denomination or their belief structure. But to simply take the Bible and expose the truth to those who want to know. Remember what we were told by Paul to avoid vain arguments about doctrines and genealogies. If it's just, a, 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 just an argument point, just walk away, avoid it. It is kind of like my, my first pastor, my first full-time ministry told me, he said, if, you, if you're going to take a stand, stand up and speak up. But if you're only going to make a point, shut up and walk away. So there are times when people ask honest questions and they want honest answers and they're going to, they need to get it from Scripture, not, not I, our opinion. In those cases, sit down and open the Bible and share what God has said and, and don't belittle. And, and I, I actually mentioned this because at the time, I had just rededicated my life. I just started studying again and, and was really kind of getting any things. And this was a set of verses I really didn't know how to explain. I, I wasn't following the grammar when you brought it up, and I, I really didn't know what to do with it. And, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure how to explain this to you. I, I really don't know what I, what I need to tell you. I just know that this can't be about losing your salvation. And I said to him, I would be cautious. And, and I don't mean this in a smart like way, but I would be cautious that you don't address the children of God as dogs or hogs, since those were always used as a derogatory term or a term for those who had not trusted Christ, those who were without, right, without the righteousness of Christ. And I said, well, be careful about that. And, and then a mate exploded over that, and, and the conversation ended right there. So I would caution you as well, and anybody that you talk to, be cautious. We are talking about children of God or children or people who are not children of God. If we're talking about children of God, God addresses them as children or as his sheep. Dogs and hogs is always referred to the Gentile people or those who rejected Christ. So let's move now back to what he says. So he said, for if they have escaped the pollutions of the world... It, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, overcome. The latter end is worse with them than in the beginning. So I, I want to be a little boring with you for a moment, and let's kind of break this down a little bit. Notice the lack of change. The dogs returned, and the pigs returned. Notice there was no changing. It didn't say a sheep turned back into a dog, or a sheep turned back into a pig. It said the dog the dog has returned to his mom. The pig has returned to wallowing in its mire. That's just great before lunch, isn't it? Just great thoughts just before we go have a fellowship and food. If you're on a diet, that should help. It says, for if, this means because, because weather, because that, after they escaped, they have escaped. They, again, remember, every time you see they, them, we're talking about false teachers, we're not talking about, he's not addressing the saved in this. He's telling the saved how to identify false teachers. So he's speaking of the false teachers. So they have escaped the pollutions, that's shameful deeds or defilement. They have escaped the shameful deeds or defilement of the world, the world or the world order through knowledge. This is in recognition or knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you have knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and not be saved? Absolutely. Are there people today who believe the history, believe the facts of Jesus Christ, but do not trust him for salvation? Yes. Okay? So they have escaped the pollution. In other words, they've learned what righteousness is because they have got knowledge, they have learned of Christ. So they, these false teachers, are again entangled. They go back to being involved in that which they had overcome, and if they're overcome, to be defeated or succumbed to. And then he says the latter end, the, the last part, is worse than at the beginning for these false teachers. 
it had been better for them not to have known. It would have been better if they had not known or recognized the things of Christ, the way of righteousness, which it means the path or the, the way of righteousness. Then after they have known the path of righteousness, recognize the righteousness to turn from the holy commandment that was delivered to them. So, let's talk about this for a second. Holy commandment. Let's look at some verses. John 3, beginning in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Can't talk. A ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now notice he has not asked a question yet. He's just making a statement. He's acknowledging Christ as a teacher and that he's of God because he's doing things that only God could do. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, human birth, and of the Spirit, trusting Christ a spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Drop down to John 3, verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his de deeds should be proved." But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So everything we have seen about false teachers to this point shows that they are subversive, they are subtle. They try to sneak in. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, Having your conversation, your lifestyle, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The day of visitation is the idea, it literally means the coming of divine presence or divine power, whether that is for good, for something beneficial, or for judgment. So Peter says, you need to live your life because there's a day of visitation to all men when the power of God shows up and they have a, they have a decision to make, either to trust Christ or to reject Christ. Romans 10, 8 through 10, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1 Timothy 2. Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, which we'll get to another time. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love not the world, the love of the if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. 
they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So there's two pieces that I want you to see here. First of all, the commandment that he talks about when they received the commandment that they should not have neglected was a commandment that all men should repent and come to salvation knowledge. God is not slack. He's going to deal with things, but he is patient. He's long-suffering so that all men have time to come to salvation. It is not his desire that any should perish. But there is a command of God that there's a payment for sin. And that payment is due. And the moment we leave this life, that payment begins. If we do not trust Christ, we enter into eternity as lost, owing the penalty of sin, which is eternal death, separation from God in a place of torment called hell. I know we don't like to talk about that today. We don't want to talk about that bloody religion. We don't want to talk about hell. We don't want to try to scare people into heaven. Listen, if you get scared enough to trust Christ, I don't care how you get there. As long as you trust Christ as Savior. God can do what he wants to, how he wants to in each and every life. And some are going to get saved by love. Some are going to get saved by fear. And quite honestly, as long as they get saved, I don't care which method they get saved by. Because the issue is, do you trust Christ as your Savior? Because without that trust, there is no salvation. Without salvation, there's no heaven. We, I, I spent several hours yesterday talking to a man that was really struggling in some things, and one of those was dealing with some forgiveness. And I find that most Christians, even pastors, do not understand what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not, everything is just fine now. Forgiveness is not, okay, well, now I trust you after you violated me, if you've broken my trust. I trust you now. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is simply giving up your right to recompense. When we, are, uh, 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 when we are offended, whether that is physical, emotional, mental, uh, a broken trust, whatever it is, there's a payment that is due. Whether that is simply coming and humbly saying, I ask for your forgiveness, I did you wrong, or that is, this was an issue of of theft, and it needs to be repaid, and needs to be repaid with some, with some extra because of the violation. Whatever it is, there's a payment that is due the offense. And forgiveness says, I'm not going to make you pay what you owe me. I'm going to relieve you of that burden. I forgive you. I'm going on about my business. If somebody's broken your trust, it doesn't mean that instantly you trust, or that suddenly you're going to forget anything that ever happened. How many of y'all have forgotten everything bad that's ever happened to you? You just don't ever remember it anymore. It's not possible, is it? And we have a devil who loves to throw that stuff back up into our thoughts anyway. God is the only one who can forgive and forget. God is the only one who can cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, to throw them in his sea of forgiveness, to remember them no more. He's the only one who can do that. We can't. We can learn to not think on it, to not bring it up, and eventually it will fade away in our consciousness, and in so doing, we, in a, a sense, forget. But forgiveness is not going to somebody and saying, listen, you really did this, you, you violated me really bad, and, and, but I just want you to know it's okay, I forgive you, and everything is great, I just want us to be good friends and, and brothers and sisters, and, and everything's all hunky-dory now. It doesn't work like that. It is simply saying I will not make you pay what you owe. Now, let's put this into context to see if this is correct. So God said, we are guilty from our conception. Correct? David said, I was conceived in sin and iniquity was I brought forth. We are in sin the moment we are conceived because we're conceived by sinful humans. Started with Adam and Eve and has been spread through the blood for every generation ever since. Correct? Correct? So I'm guilty before God, and all I did was get conceived. Thanks, Mom and Dad. All I did was get conceived, and I'm already guilty before God. I'm already on death row. And I'm just waiting for the day that the jailer opens the door and says, this is the day for execution, which in our terms means this is the day I leave this life. But God so loved the world, His creation, us, 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him, trusting belief on Jesus, will never perish but have everlasting life. God says, if you will trust my son, I will not demand the payment you owe me for sin. If you will simply take him, if you will simply trust my son, his blood that was shed for you, if you will just trust that, I will look at you through his blood and I will forgive your sins. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Forgiveness is just releasing the person who caused the offense from the payment they owe. That's it but it is the most relieving thing you will ever do in your life. Most of us, we get hurt and we hang on to it and we hang on to it and we hang on to it and we don't forgive because we got a deluded vision of what forgiveness is on our minds and we don't realize all it is is saying, I'm not going to make you pay. When I willingly release that, I'm free. Until I do that, I'm waiting for that person to come to me on hands and knees and broken glass to apologize. But when I say I forgive, I refuse to make you pay, I'm free. It doesn't matter what they do or what they don't do. I'm free. If you want to be free, forgive. So we have a forgiveness here, the command to trust Christ, to be free from sin, to be forgiven of the penalty of our sin. The other thing that we see is that there are people who knew the story, who knew the plan of salvation, who knew detail about Christ in the way of righteousness. And they walked with people who knew the way of righteousness, but didn't just know it. They had trusted Christ and they were living in it as redeemed children of God. And John says, they came out from among us because they were not of us. How do you know what's the ultimate way that false teachers are going to get revealed? When we stand for the truth, they will come out because they're not of us. They're not saved. They're not honoring God, and eventually, if they can't get their pernicious ways going, they will come out because they're not going to travel and endure the pain and the things that come with honoring God, especially in this day and time. And folks, this day and time is getting ugly. You need to go look at the news. We were just talking about this morning. You need to go look at the news about this horrible, fanatical guy that just counsels on sidewalks outside of abortion clinics. And an entire team of FBI, guns drawn, took this dangerous man into custody. That happened last this morning, wasn't it? it was yesterday morning. It was early morning. Took a whole big band of armored up, weaponized people to go get this one guy whose entire crime is he stands on the sidewalk and he tries to counsel women before they go make a horrible decision. It's terrible. The greatest threat to society right there. You think that this country is not coming after you? Here's the rest of the story. A man approached his 12-year-old son who was with him and he wouldn't get out of his face and he pushed him away. He filed charges and it was all dropped. Totally done. Except our Department of Justice picked it up. Because they're not going to let that go unanswered. That a man pushed a vulgar mouthed man away from his 12 year old boy. And now we send a whole troop. I don't remember the exact numbers, like 30 or 40, something like that, men that showed up. Folks, this is here. It's here. It's now. It, it's, it's not coming anymore. It's in full force. And it's going to get a lot worse. 
And in the middle of the chaos, false teachers are going to creep in. And they're going to try to say things and teach things. And we've got to be aware of that. But if we stay the course... And we, we match everything that is taught and spoken by the Bible. We'll know the truth. And when those cannot hang out and stay with God because they're not of God, they will leave. You will see them. They will go on their own. They will try to entrench. But when they can't, because we're staying close to God, they will depart. They will be revealed. They may be good. They may go for a long time before we figure it out. But they will be revealed. God has said it will be. So they're going to be revealed. They're going to come out because they weren't of us. We have a commandment. And what he's telling them is it would have been better had they just never heard about the righteousness of Christ than to hear it and understand it and reject it. To make a show, to walk in it, but not really have it. There's a lot of people in churches today just like this. They may not even be false teachers. They're just people who are walking a walk but have no possession of faith with Christ. And they're going to be rudely surprised when they have to stand before Christ and He says, depart from me. I never knew you. Now, you say, well, preacher, I, I don't know. I, I'm following you and I kind of got that. But do we have some examples in this? Yes, we do. Do you remember Naomi? She's married, has a couple of sons. They go off into another country. There, their sons marry two Moabite women. And through the course of time, the two sons and, and Naomi's husband dies. And she says, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going back to Israel, I'm going back to the place of my birth. And the two daughter-in-law said, we want to go with you. Now, understand the, understand the scene here. Both Moabite girls, Ruth and Orpah, both married Hebrew men, both learned of God, both learned of redemption, both lost their husbands to death, both faced a crisis, both heard Naomi's plan to return to Israel, both decided to go with her. But in the end, only one accepted the truth and followed. Only one trusted the Messiah. The other turned back. Had they both been enlightened? Had they both heard? Had they both tasted of the knowledge of Christ in the way of salvation? They both learned it all, yet only one trusted it. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you go, I go. She recognized the God that Naomi served was the one true God. And in doing so, God blessed her immensely. And you can go read the book of Ruth and see all the other stuff that happened in her life because she trusted the Messiah. This is not about salvation. This is not about being saved and losing salvation. This is about never having been saved to begin with. The dog never stopped being the dog. The pig never stopped being the pig. And when pressed, return to what they were, doing what they've always done. It's not about losing salvation. This is a picture that there are people among us and will be more among us who don't really know the Lord as Savior. They can say some stuff. They can speak some Bible. They can make a show. But it's not real. And some of those are going to be false teachers whose whole intent is to disrupt the church of God, God's people, and the plan of salvation from getting out. But we don't have to be scared. We don't have to be worried. We just have to read and watch and do the kind of judgment we were told to do, not being critical, but evaluating the fruit of somebody's speech so that we know this person is truly of God, this person is not. And if this person is not, what's our first duty? We find a false teacher. What's the first thing we should do? I'm clean, get out of here, go away. Is that what we should do? No, our first duty should be try to 
educate them, try to teach them the right way, and maybe let them understand what they're missing and trust Christ. And then if not, come on, we're not going to have that teaching here. We can't forget our first duty to God is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as ourselves, meaning we need to have the mindset that God has. The goal is to win people to Jesus Christ and to be aware there are those who will be subversive to come in among us and we must be able to recognize them and this right here is all we need. Are you reading? Are you learning? Are you spending time with God just reading? Not studying something specific. That's great. We need to do that. But do you ever just read to just be in the presence of God? If you're not, let me encourage you. Learn to sit and read just for the sake of being around Jesus. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? We can play a game, we can talk a talk, but if we've never found a place in our life, if we cannot go back and pin down a time, and I'm not talking about knowing the date and everything, I don't care about dates. Can you say there's a time in my life when I know, I became aware of the fact that I am a sinner, I am undone, I am under judgment of God, and I recognize and I believe that Jesus died for me, and I put my trust in Him and ask Him to forgive me of my sins. If you cannot pinpoint that time, again, I'm not talking about day, can you just say, I remember, I don't know when it was, but I do remember a day. Man, I, somebody was talking, some preacher was preaching, and I was sitting in Sunday school, wherever it was, and I suddenly realized, man, I'm a sinner I'm in trouble with God. I, re I realize Jesus died to fix this problem, and I trust Him. If you can't do that, I want to challenge you today. Put everything else aside and just stop and evaluate who you're at with God because if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're not right with God, and there is a penalty. It is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And it's so easy to fix. Jesus saved me. Have you done that? Christian friend, are we reading so we know what's happening around us? If we wait till we're in handcuffs, it's too late. Do you know what the Bible says? Are you confident in the security of God? and the grace of God, so that no matter what happens, you're willing to testify and be a witness of His grace no matter what is happening. It's here now. It's happening that we have a nation attacking its own people simply because we're children of God and we stand for the truth of God that life, all life, is valuable and important and purposeful, including the womb. It's going to cost us. Are you ready to pay the price? Because the rewards are fabulous. Presence with God. Hearing Him say, well done. Are we ready? It's here. Father, we are in very dire times in our nation. And we know that you're not unaware of that. This didn't catch you by surprise. You prophesied it thousands of years ago. And we seem to be playing catch-up, and we've had your word all these centuries. It's going to be telltale time now for your children, who is and who isn't, who's going to stand and who's going to run. Father, I pray that standing is what we see in this family. That every one of us are prepared to stand and testify, to give an account and not deny you, no matter what comes. We see that there are false teachers that are here. We know that they're going to try to get in among us. We know all these things. Father, you just showed it, and we've just spent several weeks looking at them so we can know for sure how to identify these subversives. 
and that we're not to forget that we are to love you and love others. Have the mind of Christ that came to seek and to save that which is lost. But it is a spiritual battle. And we have to be trained and ready. I pray we get serious if we're not here. We get serious about learning what it is we are to be doing, how we are to be doing. Study time is over. Test time is here. Help us, Father. Help us to look on this with joy, knowing that it's also a sign that your return is at hand. It's not long now. It's going to get ugly, but it's not long now. We'll be at home with you. We're on the last stretch. Help us not quit now. If anyone's here and does not know you as Savior, I pray this right now, that they trust Jesus Christ. They ask Him to forgive them and experience the joys of being gloriously forgiven, saved and on their way to an eternal home with you. Speak to our hearts, Father, whatever we need. Encourage us, motivate us to serve, to follow you, to give up whatever we're hanging on to and do what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.